Okay, hello everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Creature. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today I'm continuing my conversations with uh, Brother Jason Jack. And today we're going to uh, review, um, kind of um, interpret and elaborate on many verses. Uh, we have a list of 101 verses uh, that all clearly state that we're saved by faith alone and uh, no religious works are required for our salvation. This is the doctrine of uh, free grace, uh, that, that uh, salvation is a free gift and uh, that we don't work for it or earn it. And sometimes people, um, quite, matter of fact, quite often, people want to argue with us and tell us that faith in Jesus is insufficient. More is required on your part. So we, we want to show you all many of the verses. There's actually hundreds of verses if we wanted to really find every one of them. But there's 101 verses we're going to go through. It might take us several sessions to get through it all because we're going to take our time. Uh, but, uh, brother, uh, um, let me get you any just opening thoughts on you before we get into these verses. Any, any thoughts as we begin this? Well, uh, uh, I would say that this particular subject is the most important subject um, in the Bible and in uh, Christendom. And, and, and uh, it really is the litmus test that determines if someone is in the faith. You know, the verse in Romans that says, test yourself whether you be in the faith. Uh, this is what it really boils down to. Uh, the way we test ourselves is... What is your faith? Well, tell me what you believe uh, regarding salvation. Uh, that's how we test our faith. And, and the answer to, to the question is simply that my faith is in Jesus, not in my own ability to earn salvation. I'm relying completely on Jesus and what he's done for me uh, by dying for my sins and, and by raising himself from the dead. He's, he's uh, given us the, the proof that he is God and Savior. So um, this is really kind of the dividing point that separates uh, true Christianity from um, probably 95% of professing Christians in the world uh, that uh, believe that faith in Jesus is not enough. Um, I want to say one other thing, get your thoughts on this too, before we, we get into the verses. And that is that uh, I, I've made videos about how to study the Bible and so that you're... Uh, you're able to understand it correctly. And there, there are some basic principles, but the one principle that I think is uh, probably, I would say is number one in terms of uh, formulating a doctrine and determining, well, what do I, what do I actually believe? Uh, and that is, you, you put your, your faith in the verses that are clear cut rather than the verses that are uh, ambiguous. Um, so if a verse is clear, and undisputably says something that uh, uh, is easy to understand. Uh, and then if the verse, that the, the point of the verse is repeated over and over again, dozens of times, in this case, hundreds of times, the premise that um, uh, all that's required for salvation is faith in Jesus, uh, if, if it states it clearly and repeats it hundreds of times, then we can be confident that we've got the right doctrine. And so uh, that's why I, I think this is going to be a very worthwhile uh, pursuit today, uh, is showing that there's a lot of verses and they're very, very clearly stated. Uh, so uh, that to me is one of the most fundamental um, principles of Bible study and, and formulating doctrine. 
Uh, what do, what is your your thoughts on uh, on that as yeah, my? We have we have 101 verses that uh, we're going to go over that show that salvation is not by works. And so, if you have that many clear verses, and I think viewers will see as we go through this how truly clear they are. Um, then, if you have one or two that seem to contradict that, then Go with a hundred clear ones, then that maybe you're interpreting the one or two that seem to contradict improperly, and you need to read it in context to see exactly what is being said in scripture, because there's no contradictions in scriptures, um, you know, in the scriptures, and every word of God is pure, and every word of God is true, and you know, it, it comes first with. Uh, you know, the first thing I do is a litmus test when I, you know, hear a preacher, hear, you know, what they're telling me, whether it's, um, you know, in person at a church or on the internet or wherever, I make sure they understand the gospel and that they're clear on the gospel. They have the gospel and they understand that, that it's by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone, then I know that they are going to understand other doctrines of the Bible in a better fashion because they have the Holy Spirit and the Word of God is spiritually discerned. Um, so, yeah, understand the understand that the Word of God is true. Understand what the true gospel is, and then uh, if you have some hard, tough passages. Uh, we can do that later, you know, oh, I think you did that with Jack Smack, you know, going through some uh, problem verses. Um, you know, you can quickly see exactly what those verses are stating and that there's no contradiction um, with the gospel of by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Yeah, I've... Uh... Uh, I've got, uh, I think, about 65 or 66 playlists on my channel uh, on all kinds of topics. Uh, uh, there's character studies, verse-by-verse uh, -verse commentaries, uh, uh, topical studies. And uh, among those playlists, I have several playlists that are dedicated to, uh, one, uh, faith alone proven. And I, my videos and other pe people's videos I've collected are on that playlist to prove that faith alone for salvation is the correct doctrine. And then I have another playlist titled um, uh, Lordship Works Salvation Debunked. And that's where uh, I've taken on, um, the other day she noted that uh, Jack Smack and I um, discussed, uh, oh, I probably about 10 or 15 of the verses that... Uh, uh, the Lordship Salvation is trying to use to support their false doctrine. So we, we have the, the, the a term that might be helpful is there's a proof text and there's a problem text. We're going to give you 101 proof texts in this study that prove that faith alone is the correct doctrine. Uh, now, then people will say, well, what about this verse and what about that verse? Well, those are what you call the problem text that they, they, they want to give us those verses as a problem saying, look, this shows you that you're wrong. But the point I think we want to drive home first today is that um, you need to put your faith in the verses that are clear. If it absolutely clearly explicitly states something, and then it states it hundreds of times, then that's the right, the right way to uh, uh, conclude. Uh, but if you, if you do have a problem verse that, that, as you said, it seemingly contradicts faith alone, then okay, let's study and, and uh, figure out what, it, what that means, because they can't both be right, can they? I mean, I, it can't be that we're saved by faith alone and we're saved by faith and works. So um, the, the verses that people use to support the false doctrine that, that faith alone is not enough, uh, we need to answer those verses, and we have. We, 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 you've done it. Uh, Jacqueline, uh, I mean, not Jacqueline, um, Renee Rowland has done an excellent job. Uh, Jack Smack, many others, many uh, great uh, teachers have taken on all these problem texts, and we've done, I think, a very good job explaining the, them in context uh, because they're really misunderstood by the Lordship Salvationists. But today, we're going to begin focusing on the proof texts 
And uh, I'm ready to start. Any any last words before we go into the first verse here? Let's go ahead and do it. Okay. Um, this list, by the way, is not a list I compiled. It's uh, just a list that I found somewhere on YouTube when I copied it and saved it. And, uh, so I haven't even actually looked through the entire list uh, myself. I've got my own list I put together, but I don't think I have 101 verses on it. <laughs> I probably have like 20 verses that, that are like my favorite go-to verses for this purpose. Okay, the first one is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. And of course, we don't need... Uh, to go to the scriptures to uh, we anybody who's uh, uh, studied the Bible and understands this doctrine, this is the probably the the definitely one of the top. That's why they have probably have it number one on the list. It's the one verse that states so clearly. Um, so it says, "For by grace." Well, let me. I'm going to read these verses. By the way, I'm a KJV firstist, so I read it first in the KJV. But I like to look at the Amplified translation because the Amplified is like what we're doing. You and I are amplifying the verses today. We're going to expound upon the verses in our own words uh, to help uh, better understand them. Even though these verses are so clearly stated, it doesn't shouldn't really require much uh, explanation. Uh, but the Amplified translation basically is like uh, some scholars that are doing what we're doing, just trying to explain it further. But in the KJV, it says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that, not of yourselves, is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Um, now, it, a person should be able to understand that the first time they read it, uh, but uh, we're, we're going to go through it very, very uh, carefully, one part at a time. So it says, For by grace are ye saved. Uh, let me, let's stop, stop there and just give me your thoughts on for by grace are ye saved. Yeah, grace is unmerited favor. It's not anything that we can earn. And it says right there, ye, ye are saved through grace, through God's grace, through his unmerited favor. Um, and ye in the King James, meaning all of us, all of you. And, um, you know, and then it, it further expands on that, how we are saved by God's grace is through faith. But um, just going back to that, that first part of it, um, you know, it's not anything that, that we do ourselves. Okay. Uh, it, I've always thought it was interesting. Uh, I, over the years, I have actually confused it many years ago by grace through faith. And sometimes I said, uh, through grace and, or by great, by faith, you know, mixing that up. But I, I think that, uh, there is a reason that it says, for by grace. Uh, in other words, grace is the means. It's by, that's, that's the means by which that, uh, this salvation can happen. It's only because God is gracious. Now what is gracious? Uh, if I came over to your house and, um, uh, you open the door and offer, say, come on in, I make yourself at home, and you prepare a nice feast for me, and you washed my feet, and you did everything. And I'm thinking, wow, he is such a gracious host. I mean, I, I didn't expect all this. I didn't do anything to deserve this kind of wonderful treatment. That is what being, being gracious means. God is so gracious to us. Now, the, the most common, uh, uh, definition or, I'd say uh, I've heard on the word grace is that what you quoted, unmerited favor. Unmerited means that uh, we didn't do anything uh, to deserve this grace. Uh, we didn't do anything to earn it. And of course, as we go through the remainder of the verse, it, it, it really explains that further. But, but so grace is something that you don't uh, deserve, un unmerited or undeserved favor. God is showing his favor. God, now, uh, and then the word saved, uh, I'd like for you to comment if there's anything else to say about for by grace, and then I want to talk about are ye saved. But let's, let's finish up on this for by grace. I mean, like you can see that if we go through all these verses this carefully, this may take us like six months to get through 101 verses. Invisible qualities that go along with 
race, you know, love being, um, you know, sort of the top of the list, in my opinion. And it, it makes me think of Romans 5, 8, for God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Um, so there's a component of this unmerited favor, this great being gracious, um, and that being the means of salvation uh, through the person of Jesus Christ. But it comes first through God's love for his creation, for mankind. It's not that we love God, but he loved us first um, and gave us his son for the propitiation of our sin. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that uh, if we're going to really break down this grace, we've, we've, we've uh, I think, uh, elaborated quite a bit, but uh, I've often heard people use grace and mercy as interchangeable words and, and uh, concepts, but to me, grace and mercy are actually opposite. Uh, grace means that you get something good that you don't deserve. Mercy means the opposite. You're spared. Exactly. You're spared from something bad that you do deserve. Exactly. We yeah. do. We do deserve judgment and condemnation and the lake of fire. We deserve that, but we're spared it. That's mercy. So uh, there is a, a. You know, we shouldn't use grace and mercy, even though God is merciful. God is loving. Uh, but here it said by grace. That is the means by which we get this salvation. Now. Let's talk about, are you saved? Oh, oh first, uh, uh, I'm going to read this first portion in the uh, Amplified, as I said, because they have a lot of good ways of expressing this. That first portion, it says, for it is by grace, and then in parentheses, these are their, their edition, says, God's remarkable compassion and favor drawing you to Christ. Okay, so they, they think that the grace is a, is a, a drawing feature of God. It's a, uh, where he's drawing people to to Christ, uh, they've been. I don't. I don't necessarily uh, buy into to that. That God's grace is what draw is dr drawing us. God's grace is that He's making it available to us, uh, and He is. Uh, God is drawing all men. Uh, I think it just said uh, uh, when Jesus talked about be, being uh, lifted up on the cross, He said. Um, um, as Moses was lifted up the brass serpent uh, in the desert, so shall the sun be lifted up. And in that manner, I will draw all men to myself. So Christ is drawing all people. So God wants to attract everyone to Jesus and the cross and, and this free gift. Um, all right, so um, before we go on to saved, what does it mean to be saved? Um, anything else on this first portion for it is by grace? I think, that, I think that's all I got right now. Okay. Uh, it says, are ye saved? Now, we could say, are you saved through faith? But let's not, let's not just skip over being saved. Uh, what does it mean to be saved? Uh, I, I guess the obvious question is, what do you mean saved? Saved from what? Right. Yeah, and, you know, I get, um, I get out of some leaving out um, at times, especially to youth groups, you know, the preaching of uh, the concept of hell and, you know, the everlasting nature and, you know, the wages of sin, what that is, the second death. And, you know, I think it's real important that we must acknowledge that we're a sinner, that we've broken God's law, to need a Savior, but a Savior from what? And that is the wages of sin which is death, and and so that's what we're saved from. We're saved from that second death, that spiritual death that comes about through our transgressions, our rebelliousness against God, and we need to have that spiritual rebirth in order to overcome that second death through Jesus Christ, and that's the only way to overcome that. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, it, it is important for a person to understand that uh, um, we need to be saved. And, and why do I need a Savior? Or why do I need to be saved, if people wonder? And uh, and, and saved from what? Um, the, the, I don't remember where it is, but um, 
I believe it's in, in John, Jesus said that, uh, he said, uh, who is, who is, whosoever uh, believeth in the Son uh, uh, is not condemned, but whosoever believeth not the Son is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. I'm, 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 I'm sure I got that wrong, but I, I paraphrased it. But the point is, the default setting for all humanity, the default is condemnation and the second death. Now, uh, I have a playlist titled, uh, What is the State of the Dead? What happens after we die? What's the eternal state? And I, I've spent hours and hours teaching on that, and my position is not in the mainstream, but whether a person believes that a person is uh, uh, lost and, and they end up going to hell and being tormented forever and ever, or whether they believe, as I do, that they, they're lost, they're condemned, they, they uh, do go into the lake of fire, but they perish in the lake of fire, regardless of how long they're in the lake of fire, uh, the fact is, it's a very bad thing that they need to be saved from. It's a bad situation. It's a bad future. And it's the default. Everybody is condemned. Unless we get put our faith in Jesus, then it says we're not condemned. Um, so uh, anything else we need to say about being saved uh, before we go to the next point? Well, I guess a question that is kind of a, a logical question for someone to ask at this point is, well, okay, so uh, if I don't believe in Jesus, uh, my my fate is is uh, this lake of fire and the second death. Uh, why? Why did why does that have to happen? What? Why do I deserve that? And if you want to explain why people end have to go to hell, if, of course we know that. Um, no, they don't have to because Jesus has paid for their sins. But but what if if Jesus hadn't paid for people's sins and they, and they had to go to hell? Why? Well, I tell my kids, you know, there are consequences for every action that we do. You know, whether it's in this natural world or in the spiritual world, and there's not only natural consequences for things that we do. Um, you know, I give them this example, if you put something in fire, it burns, if you put something in water, it gets wet. That's a consequence of the action of being put in water, being put in fire. The same laws are true in a spiritual sense. And in the spiritual world, the transgression of God's law, the breaking of God's law, manifest in the form of a spiritual death. And that's what we are being saved from. That's what God realizes and understands, you know, having all knowledge and understands that we need a Savior and He gave that to us. It's the foundation of the world. And it's not hard to receive it. <laughs> you know, it's very easy to receive it. Um, and so, no man can boast, as we'll see later on in this verse. Uh, every man, rich or poor, uh, no matter what ethnicity, um, no matter where somebody lives, their age, their gender, is all equal to receive the free gift of eternal life. Mm -hmm. Holy. Uh, um. 
I guess we it would make sense for us to go back to the, the garden and uh, explain a little bit what caused this problem. That this, uh, um, at the fall, when Adam and Eve decided that they would believe the devil instead of God, that to me was the first sin. Um, a lot of people think that when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that their act of eating was, was the sin. But I think the first sin happened before that, and that was the, the fact that, uh, and this is the sin that is, condemns everybody today, is, is the sin of unbelief. Uh, the only reason people really do end up in hell is, is because of unbelief. Because, and the reason you're going to go to heaven is because of belief. Uh, so the, Adam and Eve, uh, they had this relationship with God, and then the devil said, uh, oh, wait, God told you if you ate from the, no the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that you'll certainly die that day. But that's not true. God lied to you. The truth is, if you eat from the, knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll understand good and evil. You'll know right and wrong, and therefore you can become in, independent. You won't need God to, to guide you in any way. You can just make your own decisions. So uh, in a way, it's like a declaration of independence from God. Well, we don't need God. We'll be, we'll be like God, as Satan said, and we'll know right and wrong. And, then, and so they, they believed the devil, and in that way they kind of rebelled and wanted independence from God. Uh, and, and so when that happened, though, uh, they, they, their spirit was, relationship with God was severed, and their body received uh, the, a death sentence, but it took about 900 years for their body to die. But from that point on, they, had, they were mortal, and their body was dying. And we've all inherited this as a, as a consequence in our genes. Uh, we have this genetic uh, it, uh, defect in our genes, and that's mortality. So the, the, the problem is that um, because of Adam and Eve's sin, we've all inherited mortality, and we're all going to die. The Bible says that it, um, it's appointed for a man once to die, and then the judgment. So in other words, it's inevitable. Every person is, is their destiny to die someday. We don't know what challenges that. Um, and then after that, it says, and then the judgment. So we'll be judged. But um, the question is, when we die and we get judged, um, what what is the uh, the remedy to a, a bad verdict in a, at that judgment? And uh, we're going to find out as we continue in this verse here. But the real question is, um, the reason they cannot, uh, they or have to go to hell, and, and, and to me, they have to go there and just be cremated and, and no longer exist and perish because they don't have eternal life. The Bible says that uh, the only way to have eternal life is to receive it as a gift from Jesus. So when we put our faith in Jesus, we return, we, at that, that point, we, we have eternal life. And, and it says that we change from mortal to immortal. Uh, uh, but if a person hasn't received that gift from Jesus and they go to that judgment, they go up there as a mortal that is, that cannot continue living forever. So they just end up having to perish in the lake of fire. I made a video titled, A Matter of Life and Death. And that's what it really boils down to. Since Jesus already paid for our sins, uh, the, the, the sin is not really the issue anymore. The, the, the issue is life. Will you, will you want to live forever in the new heavens and new earth? You've got to put your faith in Jesus and get eternal life as a gift. If you never did that, if you rejected that your whole life, then you go to that judgment as a mortal that's got to die. And the, and the, and the lake of fire is, is the uh, vehicle that caused you to die that second death. Um, all right, so that's that's more about what you're being saved from and why people, why we're all doomed to go there. Okay, we can go on to the next point, but any more thoughts? Or if you disagree with anything, feel free to tell me if you think I'm wrong on any, any count. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I agree. Okay. All right, so now the next point is, uh, it says, saved through faith. So it says we're saved by grace, but it's through faith. Uh, through faith? What's that mean? You know, they 
There's um, a YouTube channel that I have on my list of channels I recommend, and the title for the channel and actually the name of the church, uh, it, uh, the channel is, a, is the channel for a church somewhere. I don't even know what city they're in, uh, but uh, the, the name of it is um, Grace Faith 08. I imagine they established, got established in uh, 2008, but uh, uh, I heard the pastor give a sermon talking about why they have the name Grace Faith 08. And he, he said very simply, this verse here is, is, is really the verse that uh, really declares this. Um, there is a synergism. Now there is an argument in, among theologians about monergism or synergism. And monergism means that man does, has no part in it at all. God just, God just uh, chooses who he's going to save and he zaps them with salvation and against their will. And that would be a Calvinistic viewpoint, totally monergistic. Man doesn't have anything to say about it. Uh, and then synergism means that uh, man has a part to play. But, but what is man's part? The Lordship Salvers say man has to repent and change his life and do good deeds and he has to become, uh, present his own righteousness to God and be good enough. Uh, but the correct viewpoint on man's part is this faith. This grace, uh, it says, for by grace are you saved through faith. Man's part is faith. God's part is grace. God is going to be gracious and give you the salvation, but your part is you've got to put your faith, have faith. And, uh, we know that that faith must be in, in the Savior. Uh, so, um, any, any thoughts on that? And, and what, what is, could you tell me a little bit more about what actually faith means? You used the word trust. Uh, is there any more that can be said about what faith means? Well, I think a lot of people put faith in how faithful they are and their faithfulness. You know, and throughout the course of our lifetime, that's going to have its ups and down based on our life situations and um, and different different things that we experience in our lives. But you know, as it says in Galatians two fifteen, you know, the faith of Christ. And so we put our trust in his faithfulness and his promise of eternal life. That he's good on his word, the word of God, being Jesus Christ. And so I think just being assured and resting and believing and trusting in his promise of eternal life and trust that he accomplished what, you know, he set out to do for mankind who he loved so much. But we have to receive that love through Jesus Christ. So there, you know, like you said, the comp man's component it isn't this long list and steps of salvation where we have to do this or that in our action, but it's simple faith, childlike faith. Come to come to God and believe that He is and He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Mm -hmm. um, one of the problems we have among the uh, the Lordship um, heresy uh, is that uh, they redefine simple words. Uh, I made a video titled, Believe Defined. Now, I never thought years ago I would ever have to define what the word believe means. I mean, that's very elementary. Uh, and the same thing with the word repent, repentance. But they take words like repent and believe and faith and, and uh, baptism and uh, some of these key words in the Bible that are so important to understand correctly, and they re totally redefine them. Uh, so, uh, uh, faith... Uh, words that it could be uh, analogous or synonymous with faith is, uh, is believe, to trust, uh, to rely upon, to depend upon, and that means to have faith in something. Or uh, um, so, but but part of the definition of the word faith or believe, you don't find the, thing, uh, the uh, words associated with like uh, uh, do, work, um, strive, um, behave. Uh, follow, commit, uh, and you don't have uh, 
uh, phrases like, uh, you know, uh, uh, let's say, uh, pick up your cross and follow him, surrender your life, give your life over to Jesus, you know, all these ideas that people say, they, that's what faith is. Faith or believing is is giving up your life to giving your life to Jesus, you know. But those words really have nothing to do with the actual definition of the word faith or belief. Brad, mm -hmm. yeah, you hear the words or the phrases "saving faith" or "obedient faith" thrown around by worship salvation. So it's not just having faith in Jesus Christ, but you have to have obedient faith. And how do they? say that you have to have obedient faith, being obedient to death, showing your faithfulness to death. And then you ask, well, how do you show your faithfulness until death? Well, you obey. Oh, what's that mean? You know, I thought obey means simply, you know, to, to submit to what he did for us and believe in his finished work on the cross. And they'll say, well, obey means being obedient. And they'll continue that thought process to follow the law. And, you know, that means stop sinning because sin is the transgression of the law. So to follow the law means to stop sinning. And so they add this phrase, obedient faith, saving faith, just to get works back into the gospel. And muddies the gospel and confuses everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's uh, remarkable that um, people could, you know, there's a theological term, uh, eisegesis and exegesis. Exegesis is what we're doing. We read the verse and we, we, we accept what the verse says. We, we, we take out of the verse its meaning. And, 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 our, and our doctrine and conclusion comes from out, from out of the verse. Eisegesis means you, you take a, uh, your, own, your own belief and you bring it uh, uh, as a prejudice and you apply it towards the verse and force it on the verse. And so uh, there's these people that they're trying to force this heresy that works are required into even the definitions of faith and belief. But... Uh, one, one last thought on this idea of believing and, and faith. Um, the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And it also says another point, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So these two phrases are repeated. Um, I think there is a subtle distinction. The, con the, the uh, real conclusion in the end is that it accomplishes the same thing, but a slightly different way. If we believe on the Lord, that means we're depending on him. We're relying on him to do what he said he would do, get you to heaven because you've trusted him. Um, if we're believing in him, we're believing in his ability alone and his faithfulness. In other words, let, you live in Alabama. I'm in Las Vegas. If, if I told you I had to get to Oregon and I have no means of getting there, I'm going to have to get there within the next 48 hours or I'll die. Uh, and and you say, Luke, I have the ability to get you there, um, and uh, I, I, I can. I have the money, and I have the uh, the. I'll buy airline tickets. I'll fly to Vegas. I'll pick you up. I'll get, I'll get you there uh, in time. And I, I say, well, I believe you. I have, I have faith in you. Uh, that means I have faith in your ability to do it, and I have faith in your faith uh, faithfulness that you're going to actually keep that promise and do what you said. And that's how. We have faith in Jesus, in his ability and his uh, faithfulness to, to do what he promised. Um, what, one last um, uh, look at the, uh, uh, on the Amplified, I told you they have their own uh, insertions here. It says um, that you have been saved, actually delivered from judgment and given eternal life through faith. Uh so their uh, their conclusion on uh, uh, are you saved through faith, uh, I think is very, very good. You have been saved. Uh, and it's important to, to uh, uh, I think this distinction between have been saved means that it's done. You put your faith in Jesus, you, you are saved. It's past tense. It's also present tense and future tense. Uh, maybe you want to explain how that's all possible, but... 
Um, that's how the Amplified expresses it. Uh, I'm going to go on to the next portion, but anything else on, on the save through faith before we go to the next phrase? Yeah, okay. And then it says in the KJV, it says, and that, uh-oh, here's the, here, here's the, here's the tricky part. And that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Okay. Uh, now in the KJV, it has a semicolon after faith. And, it, and so it says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. I've heard a lot of people explain this, and I, I think a lot of people have this one wrong, especially a Calvinist and Roman Catholics. The way that they, the way uh, see, they see this phrase here is wrong. Um, how, how would you explain that? And that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now you've uh, you've used in your in your uh, uh, just statement just then uh, probably five or six times the word it, and I, I I remember listening to your video that you made earlier today, and you went to great pains to explain what it is. I don't even remember the verse you're talking about, but but explaining explaining what it is was critically important in your teaching today. And now you're using the word it again and again. And that's the point, that's the point I'm trying to get out here now is that, but it's not in this verse, it appears as the word that and that, not of yourself. And you said it, it, it. So the word that or it, I want to know what that refers to. What is that or it? say amen uh, but I will I will say that um, all of Roman Catholicism uh, and that's uh, probably about half of, of Christendom professing uh, Christianity is uh, Roman Catholicism uh, they the way that they explain this verse what that is or the gift and and the way that Calvinists uh, answer what that is or what the gift is is entirely different than what you just said and, and I agree with you. Uh, it, or the gift, is the salvation, the gospel, the good news of our salvation. Uh, that's what it is. Uh, but the, 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 Cal the Calvinists and the Romanists, they say the gift is faith. So let's look again. It says, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So you can see the way it's written there, how they could argue, well, see, you're saved through faith. And that, not of yourselves, well, it's referring to the faith is not of yourselves. So the Calvinists say the faith is not 
uh, of yourself through your own free will. The faith is something that God forced on you and made you a believer. Uh, so it's very, very important that we understand the subject of this first phrase, for by grace are ye saved through faith. It, even though it says saved, the whole subject here is the salvation. And, and, and the gift is salvation. Uh, and, and as Jesus said, uh, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The gift is eternal life or salvation. That's what the gift is. And yet, so they want to argue that, no, the faith is the gift. No, the faith is something that we choose freely uh, or to uh, embrace Jesus and rely on him and trust him, or we can freely choose not to, to rely on him and believe in him and trust him. Um, so the, the gift is the salvation. And uh, uh, I'm going to go on to the verse 9 now. <laughs> Boy, let's see. We went quite a long way. Yeah. You may have to just title this one Ephesians. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not in any hurry. If it takes us a year to get through 101 verses, I'm, I don't mind. But uh, I think that uh, these... Uh, it's very important that the people understand these things correctly here. And there's just so much, this verse particularly, this, there's probably more in this verse than any other single verse. Uh, so the verse 9 says, okay, it says, it is the gift of God. And then it says, even though, even though it's another verse, uh, there's uh, the punctuation uh, in the King James Committee or wh whoever published this and did the punctuation on this. And it says, it is the gift of God, colon, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, so, uh, it's referring to the gift. The gift is not of works. The gift, which is salvation, is not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, and what are your thoughts about, on that, then? Well, getting back to, you know, just letting, letting the Bible interpret the Bible, and Scripture interpret Scripture, you know, one of the... The most famous verses that we also use on soul winning, uh, Romans 6 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So again, just another verse showing you what the gift of God is. It's, it's eternal life. You know, it's not saving faith. That, you know, as you mentioned, um, some other, um, you know, denominations for Catholicism may teach. Um, but, Going into verse 9, you know, that further explains it. You know, if, if verse 8 didn't explain it enough that it's, it's not of yourselves, that it's a gift that you receive, and it's by grace through faith. It further explains it, just to make clear, it's not a work. It's not anything you can boast about, you know. Um, and it goes along with Romans 11.6, um, you know, where... Paul says, you know, we turn to a culture for a tongue twister, but in it by grace, then is it no more works? Otherwise, grace is no more grace. Mm -hmm. But if it be a works, then is it no more grace? Otherwise, work is no more work. So, there's several verses in the Bible that shows, you know, that distinguishes between grace and works and faith and works. Um, just to make sure that, you know, people understand that it's not of yourself, it's not anything you can boast about. Um, you know, if it was something that we could boast about, then we could say, well, I'm keeping the Sabbath, you know, so that shows that I have saving faith. Or I go to this particular church, or that I was water baptized, or that I'm doing these good works. You can boast on that. But Ephesians 2 9, make sure that you understand you can't, and you have to receive it as a gift, and a gift only. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, so the, the works, um, the word works is, is repeated many times uh, through the through the New Testament, uh, we're, we're, I'm sure we're going. You, you quoted another verse in Romans, and it, and there's uh, many others on our list here that cites the word works. But in every case, it, it tells us that 
like this one does. It's not of works. Salvation, which is the gift of God, uh, is, is not of works. Salvation is not because of our works. Now, uh, really, it shouldn't require any kind of explanation. If a person uh, has this verse alone, this verse by itself should uh, convince any works or lordship believer that uh, they're wrong. Uh, because it explicitly states it's not of works. Salvation is not of works. And I also make this point that getting back to the last thing I, I said about what is the subject of the verse being salvation, not faith. Uh, and that is that it says, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God. So what is this gift that's not of yourselves? They say it's faith. I say it's salvation. You say it's salvation. It could not be faith because the next ver part of portion in verse 9, it says, not of works. So if if it was referring to faith being the gift, and then it goes on to say, this faith is, that you receive not as a gift is not of works. It doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, have you ever heard of anybody argue that our faith is, is be, we get it because of our works, that we get our faith because of our works? We don't, no one ever argues that, but the heretics all argue that your salvation you get because of your works. So it just, uh, that just to me just proves that this, the subject of this, this uh, verse eight, what is the gift that is not of yourselves? It couldn't possibly be the faith. It has to be the salvation. The salvation is not because of your works. And as you said, as it says here, lest any man should boast. Could you imagine uh, going before God at the judgment and God says, why should I let you into heaven? And you say to him, well, uh, I got the sin out of my life and I went to church and I gave to charity and I did, um, you run off all this list of things that are your credentials that you're, you're presenting to God and basically boasting right to God's face and, and, uh, um, uh, basically, and, and he might say, well, well, what about my son? Well, Apparently, uh, that wasn't necessary because uh, I was able to do all these works. So um, Jesus, his death, that wasn't even necessary because I was able to do it my, on my own. I mean, imagine the gall of anybody who thinks they can go before God and boast before God that I deserve heaven. I didn't even need your son because I am so righteous. That's what they end up having to do. But it says right here, don't even think about being a boaster before God. And Paul says it again in Romans, and he says, he says that where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law of, 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 uh, of, um, faith? Of works? No, nay, but the law of faith. Therefore we conclude a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So here in Ephesians and in Romans, Paul makes a big point, a really big deal saying, don't even think about boasting. You have, if you're going to think you can boast before God, then your salvation uh, doctrine is wrong and because we have nothing to boast about it can, because it's a free gift. Um, all right, uh, let me read that last portion here in the Amplified to see how they phrase it. It says, and this salvation is not of yourselves. See, hey, look, they, they put salvation. So I'm really happy that in that translation, they, they're agreeing with us that the subject of the verse is not faith, but it's the salvation. He says, and this salvation is not of yourselves, not through your own effort, but it is the undeserved, gracious gift of God, not as a result of your works, nor your attempts to keep the law, so that no one will be able to boast or take credit in any way for his salvation. Wasn't that beautifully stated? Yeah, so I, I know that uh, I was a strict KJV onlyist for 20, 25 years, and and um, and if if someone is a KJV onlyist, that's fine. I'm not going to try to convince you otherwise. But I I think that there's a lot to be gained sometimes for looking at a verse like that because these commentaries are really in in the Amplified translation. It's kind of like a translation and a commentary blend. Uh, it's kind of like the same thing we're doing in this study here. We read the verse in the, in the uh, KJV, which we say that's our scriptures, and then we expound upon it in our own words, to amplifying it. And that's what the Amplified Translation is doing, they're amplifying it. Um, all right, so that's that, uh, that verse there. Let me see. 
Well, we got 55 minutes here, so I think you're right. Uh, we should not even think about trying to take on a verse 2. Uh, so we only have a uh, 100, 100 more verses to go. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, all right, I guess we... Let, let, yeah, I, I don't think we're going to have to be that thorough uh, on every one as we go through. Uh, but this one here, I just pers I personally think that this verse, there's a lot in this verse that is uh, somehow people just, they they dismiss it. Like, how could a person dismiss this when it says not of works? And then they think that you're saved by, by faith and works. And when it clearly says, no, it's not of works. And then they ignore that. I, what is wrong with these people? I mean, this is this verse is so clearly stated. We shouldn't need any more verses after this. We've got a hundred more. We're going to go over. We shouldn't need any more. And yet, these lordship people—they've read these verses, and it doesn't seem to phase them. So, let me get your your summary thoughts on this uh, study today. Yeah, this is a great passage. A great two verses to start to kick off uh, this study on salvation. Uh, being not a work. And as you were just mentioning, I was sort of thinking, you know, who in the right mind, you know, a, a believer in Christ that has been spiritually reborn and has the, the earnest of, you know, the, the spirit of promise that once they die and were before God, that they could ever boast about them being a good person or uh, being in obedience to God, I, I can't even imagine um, that. And that's what so many worship salvationists teach. And, you know, that's what, um, you know, hopefully this study will really, um, you know, point out is the error of worship salvation and you know committing your life to Christ uh, for salvation. You know, that's part of discipleship. That's not salvation. You know, salvation is what he did for us, not what we do for him. That's discipleship. And so, you know, hopefully this exercise will really show the distinct the distinction between Salvation and discipleship as we go along in the study. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so, well, I, I um, made a big deal about uh, someone going before God and kind of pleading their case. Um, uh, it's kind of hypothetical. There is a there is a verse though that Jesus uh, tells us that is kind of a laying uh, this kind of as a scenario. And Jesus is talking about how people would come before him and say, Lord, Lord, uh, look at all the wonderful works that we did in your name. And, and they start citing all these works and things. And, and then he says, depart from the workers of iniquity. I never knew you. And um, Jack Smack and I, in our video the other day, we talked about that verse because it's a, it's a verse the Lordship people think is on their side. But it's really condemning them. It's actually condemning them, and it's it's an example of the scenario I just proposed to you. Is it, imagine someone going before God, and He says, "Why should I let you into heaven?" And you say, "Lord, Lord, look at all the wonderful things I did in Your name. I made, I made You my Lord, and I repented of my sins, and I did that. I and and He says, "Worker of iniquity, depart from me. I never knew you." That person has put their faith in their own ability to satisfy God instead of relying on Jesus. So that's why Jesus rejected them. Uh, and, um, you know, you're, you're quoting uh, Matthew 7, 21 through 23, and like you said, you know, the Lordship Salvation will use that verse to try to support what they're teaching. And that just shows me how unbelief in the true gospel leads to spiritual blindness. They can't discern the scriptures if they're that blind and think that that verse is teaching something that actually teaches something else, which actually condemns them, as you said. Um, you know, and and that verse says, you know, Lord, Lord, we've done many wonderful works, you know, and this is exactly what we just talked about in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, that it's not of works. And so if you go up 
in front of God and say, look at all the wonderful works, when we just saw in this one verse, it's not of works, then you're trusting in yourself and not the finished work of Jesus Christ. You know, you're not receiving it freely as a gift. Um, in any addition of your own merit to God's grace, as it says again in Romans 11, 6, it's no longer grace. Mm -hmm. Yes, it says that it nullifies the grace of God. It frustrates the grace of God. And grace is no more grace, and you've made Christ with no effect. Um, so, uh, so you, you, what is the correct plea? Now, I know that you put your faith in Jesus at some point in your life, and at that moment, you got saved, and you are still saved, and you are will be saved at the judgment. It's all settled. It's not. It doesn't hinge upon this plea be, plea before God at the judgments. You go to the judgment seat of Christ for people who are already saved, just to get judged for your rewards and your ministry. But if if you did have to go before God and plead your case, you would not plead works. What would your plea be if Jesus said, uh, in like in His example, "Why should I let you into heaven?" You're not going to say, "Lord, Lord, look at the works I did." What what would you say to Jesus? playlist titled hymns and I think I take about five of the old hymns and go through them one you know word or line at a time and those hymns were some of the greatest gospel messages ever uh, apart from scripture and uh, of course one of them says uh, nothing but the blood of Jesus and that's that should be our, our only plea uh, that uh, uh, why should why Jesus why should you let me into heaven only because of the blood only because you died for me and you paid for my sins and I, I'm relying on you alone, Jesus. I'm trusting you as my savior. Uh, that's the, that's the, as soon as you as soon as you said that about you know going to these old gospel hymns, that's the first song I thought about. As soon as you were saying that, I quote um, the first verse or the chorus rather of nothing but the blood of Jesus in my book that I wrote. And I make I make the point in my book. If you're singing that song in your church, but then you're teaching a worship salvation or a works based salvation or baptismal regeneration, for instance, where it's the blood plus the water that you're baptized in, then you need to just rip that hymnal, that song, out of the hymnal and never sing it again. Because you don't believe what it says. Yeah. Yeah, and, and they sing, they can sing a song like that, or or, or uh, just as I am, and yet, and then the pastor says right after they, the choir quits singing the song "Just as I Am," the pastor says, "Repent, change your life, make yourself ready for the judgment." You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, brother, we've uh, we've gone beyond uh, we've gone beyond an hour now, an hour and four minutes, and we got through one verse successfully. So we only have a hundred more to go. I'm looking forward to this. I, it may take us years <laughs> to finish this project, but uh, it, I'm sure, for me, it's going to be a joy to go through it with you. Well, I, I agree. This has been fun, and I always love talking to you. So if it takes us a couple years to do it, I look forward to it every, every time we do it. All right. Well, thank you for uh, joining me today. And to the, the viewers, uh, uh, it should be clear to you now. Just put your faith entirely in Jesus and in uh, in that he did it all for you by dying for your sins, and that's the only reason you're going to go to heaven and trust that him and his finished work alone, and you're promised uh, heaven, and and uh, if it's a promise from God, so you you can count on it. You you can have this blessed blessed assurance and this joy and peace. Uh, all right, uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.